Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had this to say. Our concern, of course, is that the militant Islamic State of Iran um, is going to receive uh, a sure path hmm. to nuclear weapons. Many of the restrictions that were supposed to prevent it from getting there will be lifted. And in addition, Iran will get a jackpot of a cash bonanza of hundreds of billions of dollars, which will enable it to continue to pursue its aggression and terror in the region and in the world. This is uh, a bad mistake uh, of historic proportions. Hmm. Saudi Arabian diplomats said the deal was extremely dangerous. But who loves it? Syria's Bashar al-Assad. He called it a great victory and historic achievement. In short, we're treating enemies better than allies. Assad supposedly gassed his own people and they love the deal. Shouldn't that maybe raise a couple of red flags? It's going to boost Iran's coffers by half a trillion dollars. You think they're going to feed the needy with all that? Uh, promote some LBGT causes? Or are they going to use it to fund their terror network, Hamas, Hezbollah, Assad, etc.? I mean, if, think about this. If they're going to be expanding their influence and power in the region, it's a lot of cash to be able to spend. Iran was funding uh, terrorist networks covertly. This deal now lets them do it overtly. The very sanctions that brought Iran into the negotiating table are now gone. What possible reason do they have now to listen to anything we say? Proponents will argue we'll be monitoring Iran closely with IAEA inspections. Remember those? They worked out so well with Saddam Hussein. And the Obama administration now promises that they would demand any time, anywhere inspections. So they looked Iran square in the eye. And they got them. Well, they got 24 days advance notice inspections. Which is pretty much the same thing. I mean, you know, if, if Iran objects to a, a request a request for access to a site, they get a 14-day shot clock to negotiate it. If there's still no deal, seven more days are added to, uh, for a commission to come up with a recommendation. Rand then gets three days to respond to the recommendation. That's 24 days. Way to stick it to him, Barack! Yeah! The media is celebrating, but all he's done is delayed a nuclear Iran by 10 years in theory. And honestly, does anyone besides Obama believe Iran will actually stick to that timetable? Iran is now allowed to continue enriching, albeit at a reduced rate, but that reduced rate is something that most Arab nations do not have the ability to do. So because Iran is on that path, that leaves countries like Saudi Arabia left with no choice. Their crazy neighbor is now on the path to being a nuclear state. Why wouldn't they do the same? Obama has essentially created a brand new arms race in the Middle East. But why let the facts get in the way of a good Obama legacy meme on the, on the Internet? I mean, that's a historic deal, everybody. It's historic. Peace in our time. It's all good news. For the media, of course, the only negative is those damn Republicans. They might shoot it down. Every article that positions this as a historic achievement for Obama also positions the Republicans as the bad guys. What a wonderful day for Obama in the Middle East and the world! But those evil Republicans want to ruin it. And they have no ideas of their own. Oh, we've got plenty of ideas. I mean, keep sanctioning the crap out of them. Seem to be working. I know the little love wins thing played well on the internet here in America, but I guess, I don't know, we're still the great Satan? Is anyone noticing that? You can still give Iran all you want, but they're never going to love us. They can't stand us. So I guess today it's more accurate to say hate wins. We've made a deal with the devil, and we got nothing. So who are the winners? Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Obama gets to say he made a peace deal. The losers? Israel, any mildly sane Arab nation, America, and most of all, the four American political prisoners being held in Iranian prisons. Uh, Amir Hekmati, a former U.S. Marine arrested for allegedly spying in Iran, sentenced to death, now awaiting retrial. Robert Levinson, former DEA and FBI agent, arrested by Iranian intelligence. He is currently missing in Iran. Pastor Saeed Abdini, an Iranian-American pastor who has been in an Iranian prison since 2012, charged with undermining national security through private religious gatherings. I'm very, oh, how could he do such a thing? Jason Rezaian, who is an American-Iranian journalist with the Washington Post, bureau chief in Iran, he's charged with espionage and propaganda against the establishment and is under trial. No Americans left behind? Really? Is that what we're trying to say? 
Obama went to great lengths to secure a traitor in Bo Bergdahl, the guy for he traded all the terrorists for a few well, was it a year ago or so. He released terrorists to get him back. Yet he was unable to get any of these guys back in the middle of this negotiation? How is that possible? How could you not even get one? The media celebrates this historic deal? Yes, a historic failure. A landmark deal has been reached on an Iran nuclear program. Everyone is confident that this deal will prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The world is praising the arduous Iran nuclear talks' as a historic agreement. The only thing that this deal is going to be remembered for is supporting an anecdote to this period of American weakness in future history books. Here to give us the latest on why the Iran deal is not the happy rainbow sunshine agreement the media wants you to believe is our own Buck Sexton. Buck, welcome to the program. Am I, am I wrong on this? I mean, can you shine? You're not exactly, I would say, the guy who's going to shine some uh, happy rainbows on a situation like this, but can, is there anything positive to take from this agreement? I'd like to think that I'm always about happy rainbows, too, but no, there's nothing nothing really positive to say about the agreement from the perspective of what this will do to the Iranian nuclear program. I mean, look, from the Obama administration's perspective, it's great because there's no way that they will be, first of all, he's not going to be held accountable, he's not running for election again, and by the time the pitfalls of the deal, it's very intricate, I read through the text of it today, it deals with all kinds of things, banking sanctions and trade, and it even specifies that Iran can export pistachios, rugs, and caviar to the U.S. under certain, uh, if certain stipulations are met. So there's a tremendous amount of specificity, which obviously means there's a lot of room for kind of maneuvering and quibbling, and well, what does this subsection really mean? And then you get the place of, well, what does a violation really look like? What's enough of a violation for there to be the snapback sanctions supposedly coming back into place? But by the time we figure all that out, Stu, the Obama administration will be done, and will be some other president in office, and the, the claim will be, of course, that well, it's just because of what that new president, whoever it is or whoever she is, uh, uh, was going to be doing about this, uh, the situation, not that President Obama signed this in the first place. So from a legacy perspective, it's a huge win. From a we don't want to see a thermonuclear Middle East that's pointing missiles at each other, uh, it's a really bad deal. Well, first of all, I'm very excited for some uh, Iranian pistachio ice cream, uh, which is on the way very soon. That's going to be pretty exciting. At least that's one upside of this deal. Uh, but, I mean, I think from that perspective, you have a, a situation where, uh, you know, the United States has, uh, you know, a, a standing in the world where we're supposed to be, I guess, at least, at the very least, good actors, positive actors in making, uh, you know, calming things down. And I know we get criticized for this all the time. But here's a situation where it seems like legacy-wise, these peace agreements live completely separate from the reality they create. You, you have a, like, Jimmy Carter is praised for a historic peace deal, but, I mean, we haven't seen peace since that peace deal. Uh, Arafat gets, you know, Nobel Peace Prizes. Uh, these things don't, aren't realistic, and so you can see the motivation of why Obama would chase after this and make what looks like a terrible deal. No, I, I think that this was all set up to be exactly this, this moment in time when the administration, by the way, can, can really rewrite the, the history in a sense, or at least sort of uh, change the way historians will, will view and will talk about the Obama administration's foreign policy, which has been, I know you hear, we, we all hear terms like a legacy of failure, but it's really stark with the Obama administration, how bad it's been, whether it's the reset with Ru the Russian reset or the pivot to Asia, uh, red lines in Syria with chemical weapons, preventing genocide, by the way, in Syria. President Obama stood at the Holocaust Museum in 2012 and was saying never again, and he had this whole range of policy options we would deploy to make sure that exactly what is happening now in Syria and Iraq specifically the Christian communities there, as well as other religious minorities, would not happen again. It is happening. President's too busy with other things. So when you talk about I mean, peace, it's we're not right now recognizing that Iran has been at war, really, with the U.S. for a number of years. Um, and the Iranian regime hasn't changed one bit. They haven't changed their willingness to engage in support to terrorism. In fact, we're pulling off the conventional restraints over a period of either five or eight years, depending on yeah. what part of the deal. It's five for sort of conventional munitions, eight for ballistic missile technology. That was originally, Stu, never even in the picture. The idea that now we're going to say not only are we going to allow you and sort of bless your nuclear program, but on top of that, yeah, the Russian arms bazaar, go for it. See what you can pick up there. Whatever China will sell you, that's also yours to keep. Mm -hmm. This is a disaster. Yeah. And uh, the, the only thing that you can sort of 
uh, tell yourself makes this a little better, Stu, or you know, tell oneself that this is better, is that a president in the future will have the option of taking action. Okay, well, they'll have the option of taking action against a very rich, completely rearmed, nuclear-capable Iranian com- uh, country with 70 million people in it. I mean, that's not an easy option. So it, it, You're totally not right. This is what I think it, it destroys the entire argument that this is a good deal, is what you just brought up. Which is, they, we have this, uh, the way they're describing it in the media is uh, every single step, we can watch them. And if they break one of these, uh, you know, clauses, they can, we can bring the sanctions back. Which, okay, let's say a different president might try that, or whatever. First of all, when the punishment is the status quo, the situation they already had, I don't know what the negative is for them. Because there's no punishment, it's not worse than they used to have it, it's just the same as they used to have it. But beyond that... You're going to have a, this is exactly right. Beyond that, though, you're going to have a situation where uh, they're going to be a wealthier nation if we were to try to do this. Plus, you have other countries that have to be on board with us. So, if those countries like Russia, who's getting all the money from the conventional weapons, decides, "Hey, we don't want to be part of the new sanctions again," the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, snapback sanctions are a fantasy, and every objective observer, including observers of sort of foreign policy, uh, foreign policy analysts that tend to be sort of Democrat in their leanings and pro-Obama, are like, look, snapback sanctions are just not going to happen. Uh, once you open up the markets to China, Russia, and other countries, but the European countries, well, look at what happened with uh, oil for food and the UN and Saddam. I mean, that's the other part of this, too. We've sort of been to this dance before. We know how this all turns out. There were supposed to be immediate on-the-spot inspections in Iraq, and we were supposed to prevent them from doing all this. And, and the reality is that at what point does the, um, does the agreement kick into a real punishment for certain violations, the Iranians are going to claim at every turn, look at how much it took just to get to this point of the negotiations, right? The Iranians will say, well, that's not a real violation, or we'll deal with that, or we'll get back to you in 30 days, or whatever it may be. And at no point are we going to be willing to say, well, that now we're going to walk away from this deal entirely, unless they just brazenly go for nukes, and at that point it will be too late. So the idea that, and you got in this in, in the beginning, Stu, that we're going to punish them with, with sanctions. It's like, well, we were punishing them with sanctions, and President Obama said, well, let's stop doing that and talk a little bit. And now we think that we're going to get them to change their behavior with the threat of sanctions when they didn't change their behavior in the first place because of the initial sanctions. We have, we have wrested no concession from Iran. The entire program continues on more or less as is. They mothball some things. They send away some spent fuel. They keep the whole infrastructure, even the illegal nuclear facility they have, even the heavy water facility. They keep everything what, what is the hard concession they make? Yeah, and I think it's what, in eight years, they're able to potentially acquire uh, advanced nuclear technologies that they believe could, you know, observers believe they could turn into a, a bomb in weeks, years away. Again, that's eight years of us supposedly catching them. And you know, Buck, that as soon as they do something wrong, which they will, and they will violate this agreement, and they will probably get caught, what we will say is, look, yeah, we could bring sanctions back, but that would blow up this historic deal, so we can't do it. Of course. So it puts us in constraints automatically. By the way, the former head of the IAEA, um, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, said that if this is, if at this point in time, and this was a few months ago, so, uh, mm-hmm. but if at that point in time the Iranians didn't have an illegal nuclear program meant specifically for military purpose, it would be the first time in 20 years, okay? So we're assuming also on top of all this that without pre-inspections, by the way, which we have not had, that somehow we'll be able to do a full accounting of everything. I mean, we've walked away from so much of what was initially held by the Obama administration, by the Obama administration to be sacrosanct here. They would have to come clean on the whole previous program, what they were doing up to this point, what all the military uses, and, and that we weren't going to keep conventional uh, sanctions, uh, put those on the table as well for all this. And there's so much that we've essentially caved on. And when you look at what you really get in this agreement, it's just really an agreement to continue to talk and, and get into this back and forth with the Iranians. Ultimately, all this boils down to, do you believe the Iranians are going to change their behavior, that the, the inherent nature of the regime is going to be something different in five or ten years? I think the answer is no. And do you think that at some point they're going to go nuclear and they want nuclear weapons? I think the answer is yes. I think everything else is kind of just getting into the details 
uh, of the agreement without really looking at what's at stake. Yeah, and of course you could just see how you know what kind of agreement it was for us by the people celebrating it: Assad and Iran and Russia. I mean, it's just it's plain as day. And you know, Buck, you know this stuff better than everybody, every anybody, and you you really do boil down into the the nooks and crannies of this. And I was kind of interested to see today the world reaction to it, which was overwhelmingly positive. Now, of course, the world looks at this as saying, "Hey, good, America got screwed." Essentially, uh, that's probably the way they're looking at it. I was listening. Watching or listening to the BBC this morning, and they had first of all a guest on who was claiming the only reason there'll be any opposition to this to all is because of the high finance of uh, the uh, Jews in the American media, uh, which I thought was a, a tad anti-Semitic, especially if they ranted on for it for about ten minutes. But then they had a guy on from the Likud party who said, "Look, you know, we are keeping all options on the table here." Uh, and the woman on, B- on the BBC screamed at him and said, "What do you mean you're keeping all options on the table?" Why why is it that you are not interested in peace, a supposed journalist? To which he responded, uh, look, you know, we are in a situation where we need to be able to defend ourselves if we feel threatened. And she screamed at him and said, you are not under threat from Iran. Period. Now, well, I mean, Rouhani, Rouhani who's the moderate uh, apparently in Iran. Right. That's how they describe him. It's sort of like saying the Muslim Brotherhood's moderate in, in comparison to Al-Qaeda, but Rouhani, who's a, a relative moderate here, was tweeting out today that, you know, it's good that the world, more, this is sort of a paraphrase, but it's good that the world didn't believe the lies of the Zionist entity, which is, of course, aggressive on many levels, including the fact that they refuse to acknowledge that there is this country called Israel that is a, is a United Nations member and the rest of the international community accepts as such, and, and they, well, at least a lot of it accepts as such. Not all countries do, obviously, but the Iranians uh, continue to have this sort of bellicose rhetoric. What we've done, though, is really box the Israelis in. We had the Iranians boxed in. Boxed in. Let's, let's just make that very clear. Their currency was in free fall. Their economy was being strangled. There was opposition to this sclerotic, evil regime on the streets of Tehran from the beginning of the Obama administration, by the way. I mean, so there was already a sort of jump start. He didn't touch that. He didn't want to get involved. This is back in 2009, 2010. He didn't want to do anything about that. But now what we've seen is the, the President Obama has pulled the constraints off of Iran to get this deal. We know it's a huge... He went into this saying, anything to get a deal is what we're going to do, which is never how you want to negotiate. But the Israelis are now the ones who are constrained because if they do, and I think when they say all options are on the table, they are serious about it. If they do something against the regime, if they go after nuclear sites in Iran... They will be in flagrant violation of this huge, wonderful agreement that's going to create peace throughout the Middle East. And the Iranians don't want any bad blood. They don't want anything like that at all. <laughs> the Israelis will have to deal with the fallout from that. And that will include the entire Muslim world. It includes all of the Europeans. It'll include a whole bunch of countries. And it's because of this deal. Mm. So I don't even think the, Isra- the Israelis would literally have to think that Iran was... Uh, has, is about to go nuclear, has gone nuclear, and they must strike now or else they are in peril for the survival of their state. Otherwise, they won't strike. Israel having to deal with the fallout is a very good way of putting that, Buck, because that is kind of what we're actually uh, looking at here in this particular situation. Let's go back to... Uh, double the double entendre, unfortunately. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Let's go back to the uh, domestic uh, side of this for a second. Uh, there is, of course, this hope uh, you know, I know that the Iran has a supreme leader. They can do whatever they want. There is this hope that Congress could theoretically act and stop this. But to me, looking at it as face, I mean, they might block the bill, but they're not going to be able to override this veto. Is that how you're reading this? Yeah, I, I think that this is going to go through. I think the president uh, would veto it without the, without the number of votes needed to override. They're not going to get to that number because it would be... And look, what's the most important thing to Democrats in the House and the Senate at this point? Really, the the legacy of the Obama administration, but really the legacy of the Democratic Party. And they're trying to sort of show themselves as we're the the party that doesn't go to war. We're the party that gets deals done and figures it out through diplomacy. And so they won't undercut the administration, despite the fact that there has been a lot of bipartisan criticism of this. I can't see the Democrats coming along with Republicans in large enough numbers to override a a presidential veto on this. And so I, I think we're probably stuck with it. And yet again, here we are. Republicans have the House and the Senate. And it feels like nothing has changed since the last election. I, I, I'm still waiting for them to do something, to put something even in front of President Obama, even if he were to veto, we say, well, at least they're, they're moving the ball down the field and they're getting the conversation going in this country. And on this issue, yeah, there are some voices that I think have done a pretty good job of outlining why this Obama deal. I mean, the president was hell-bent on getting this done. This was, mm-hmm. There was nothing that was going to prevent this. You cannot go into a negotiation that way. They gave away the store. 
Find me, I mean, Stu, this was an exercise that I, I did before today with uh, another friend who's an, who's an expert on national security. Said, find me the painful concession. What is the thing that the Iranians had to say, okay, um, I guess we'll do that. Uh, get access to $100 billion in frozen funds. Uh, stop spinning some of the centrifuges they're allowed to keep. I mean, this is preposterous on its face, but again, for domestic political reasons, it's going to be celebrated as a huge victory. This shows us that President Obama is the international relations genius that the, uh, the, the left in this country has been holding him up to be, despite all the problems of the past. This will wipe all of that away and... Uh, Open change. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Buck six, a great insight, man. It's it's an amazing day. It's an amazing day. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Dude, it, 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 it's amazing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks. I was uh, actually seeing that uh, the BBC was mentioning what they thought that big concession was, which was uh, uh, that they will disclose what they have done in the past as far as what they've done with the nuclear weapons development. But, so we're gonna. So we're gonna. Wow, we get a tall tale about what they used to do with nuclear weapons. What a win, Obama. What a win. Back in a second.